Hello and welcome to Michael and Ivanka's Grand Podcast, which is now a weekly study session between me and Ivanka, where we try and make sense of complex, complex proposals. I mean, I don't know how many more complex proposals are in the pipeline, but that's what we're doing this week and what we did last week. My name's Michael Forrest. And I'm Ivanka Magic. And this week we're going to continue talking about the silver gun hypothesis. Delton Chen wrote, has been working on this thing for five years, um, full time, and I had the uh, I had the pleasure of talking to him for an hour and a half on Monday, and trying to ask questions that, I mean, partly to try and understand better, to, but also partly to try and prove that I remotely understood any of what he was saying. So it was a, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a conversation where he sort of took me through his thinking, and I and I've sort of come out with a couple of bits of relative clarity from that conversation. But it, I don't think it will be the last one we have either. Was he? Is he nice? He was. He was. Um. He was nice, and he's sort of like. Um. I, yeah, I got a laugh, some laughs out of him, and I think he sort of like loosened up towards like by the end of the first hour. He sort of. Um, he sort of, um, he, he, I think he, he sort of like said, sorry if I seem a bit sort of defensive about this. I, it's been my, I've been working on it for five years on my own and like I've sacrificed a lot to kind of work on this thing and I just want to, you know, make sure that it's understood clearly. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, I, I get the feeling. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> I understand uh, and empathise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I tried to talk, I try, you know, we haven't really had a chance to catch up this week, so we're going to be doing that on podcast because um, I did kind of come at you with a load of stuff on Monday after I'd had this conversation. So, um, which frankly, I had this strange thing of like, I really had to, I, I, this hour and a half conversation that was just absolutely like, you know, I had to use every last bit of juice my brain had available for it. And then just the rest of the day, I couldn't, I just found that I was just like, empty. <laughs> I, was just, I just kind of went slack. <laughs> I was sort of trying to work on work stuff. And just going, well, I'm sure I can know how to do this normally, but my brain is not playing. And plus, there was quite a lot to think about. So I just sort of ended up calling it a half day on, on, on the sort of day job and just kind of like going, OK, well, I guess I just need to relax and think about this. But I've had a couple of days to cogitate and now I am ready to express Very it. I think part of the reason I haven't responded to your um, your notes on Slack were because uh, I'm in that anal- like last bit of analysis phase of the work I'm doing at work. So when <laughs> I leave work, I've got nothing. There's like I sit on the train and I'm not mm. reading anything. I'm just staring into space because there's no <laughs> there's no room for more inputs. But I did I did manage to fit in going to a talk on Tuesday. It wasn't really a talk. It was a Department of International Trade event, the Global Entrepreneurs Program, which I got invited to by some Balkan developer types uh, mm. off the back of my tweet. So right. I was like, sure, Excellent. yeah, I'll join in with being a sort of a, an ambassador for the Balkan states. Mm. Uh, and uh, But that was quite fascinating as an event, which I could probably talk about for 15 minutes. But the interesting thing for us was a woman called Manjula Lee who has a platform it's more than it's more advanced I'd say than our friend Delton's thing called the world found of worldwide yeah worldwide generation it's called so but what it is is a uh, distributed ledger technology <laughs> um, okay uh, she says she doesn't say uh uh, uh, Bitcoin anymore because people just kind of go. Um, <laughs> uh, but basically, she uh, she's she was as a human, she was very inspiring and good to listen to. You know, 
satisfying, knowledgeable. It was like, yes, I'll do whatever you say. She was very inspiring. Mm. Uh, she'd come up, she was sort of an Aussie, Sri Lankan, um, South African combo of a human. Uh, mm. And she had worked in the uh, oil and gas industry. She, she was probably younger than me, I'd say. Uh, and then sort of sat there maybe 10 years ago and hadn't gone, hang on a minute, the world's coming to an end, what should we do? And came up with that. And part of the problem that lots of people identify is that there's lots of in things that people do with the aim of having, a, what, what Manjula Lee talks about is having a sustainable planet in 10 years, within 10 years, because mm. that's the timeline, that's the deadline. Um, but then there's lots of activities, lots of things that people are doing, but it's very hard to measure them and to see if they're doing anything. So yeah. her, uh, so there's lots of things like since sustainable investment programs, blah, blah, you know, projects, blah, blah, but nobody can see if they're working and how do you count that they're working. Mm. Anyway, her product is a, um, is designed to help do that, measure the effectiveness, measure the, uh, increased traceability. Well, Del, that potentially dovetails quite well into what Delton's talking about as well. Because I think the weakest point of his, well, we'll get into it, but I think one of the weaker points was this kind of like, someone's got to decide whether what you're doing is climate friendly or not. And he sort of was talking about like a private assessor or like the internet, yeah, like yeah. some sort of authority that can say that your work is valid. But if, the, if your person's... Uh, you know, yeah. someone else is actually working on that. And, let's and measure it, and, it ties into the work, the UN sustainability goals. Like it's properly, I've just found the actual website now. I have to confess that I, I googled it the other night when I, she was doing her talk, and I, the, their SEO is not very good. <laughs> I think it's it's both Catherine Cahoe's talk and what you're finding out from that. You know, there are lots of activities, there are lots of things people are doing. I think the idea of measuring it is not uh, insignificant. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, yes, I'm not trying to find a new thing. I'm just talking about the fact that I found a new thing that sounded very interesting. Oh, and the other big news is that the, the as we call it, the, the rubbish search engine that I use, <laughs> the, the uh, Ecosia or Ecosia uh, search engine has planted 50 million trees this week. They didn't plant them this week, <laughs> but they Is have five reached their or five o five zero 0 million trees they have planted. Wow. Wow. Which is, you know, you know, it's made it all worthwhile <laughs> having to sort of occasionally go. Anyway, thank you. Google dot com. <laughs> uh, yeah. You wouldn't take Google could just go. Yeah, well, all right. Well, we'll plant trees as well. Well, they could, but they're not. They should, Why shouldn't they? they? That's, what, well, I, that's what I was thinking. Petition them. Just I'm plant gonna... trees. Your competition's doing it. It yeah. would be easy for you to do. <laughs> it would. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just do it. You'll get, you'll get fifty million trees in a in a in a nanosecond. Mm. Please talk. Tell me about your week, Michael. <laughs> no. I'm really interested. <laughs> no, like to be honest, like I, I, um, I, I've been. I don't know. I, I, do you know I have these cycles with jobs? where I kind of come in and I, I, I kind of use, I have a lot of energy to, I'm empathising, I'm kind of like helping, I'm like being, I am showing people new ways of doing things and people seem to like me and blah, blah. And then it sort of like reaches a point where it's like, okay, I've just had enough of, you know, I, I kind of start to reach a plateau and then just, it just starts to get a bit, I don't know. Like, why am I, why am I having to, deal with this I just want to kind of get on with something else and even like weirdly like last Monday just it can happen in such a short space of time and I was a bit worried that I was kind of hitting that stage with this job already even though it's kind of give I've got so much freedom and like last Monday was the first Monday and I can't remember how long that I actually really enjoyed myself on a Monday working because for ages I keep having these Mondays where I'm just like I just hate it <laughs> like why are you make it you know just coming back to work and just after the weekend being really nice, just kind of going, oh, I hate it. So I was feeling really optimistic about it. And then just, I don't know, just this week I've been like coming down a bit. But then um, this morning I got paid and it was like, 
I think like for the last three years, I've been like pretty much constantly in sort of austerity mode and just feeling like I haven't got any money. And like this morning, I'm like, am I out of it? Am I out of the hole? Have I finally hot? Because it was like I'm working really hard and I feel poor still. Like you're supposed to at least feel that like you've got money when you're working hard. And just for eight, and I was just having that feeling. It was coming back again. And it was like, but then I saw that bank balance this morning. I was like, oh yeah, there is. That's why we're doing this. And just the fact that I'm like, oh, like it's just kind of put me in a brighter state of mind that I can like go, oh, I could, um, I could, uh, yeah, that, that that thing I want to do, I could do now. That's good. I could buy some shoes. <laughs> I could, you know, I could, I could. And plus that combined with the fact that tomorrow I'm moving into a new studio. So this will uh, hopefully won't, hopefully I can get the audio sounding as good as in this room. Um, hopefully there will be less sort of door slamming sounds, but there may be some judo sounds. I'm, I'm still not 100% sure what that's going to be like, but I'm moving into this new studio. So half the price, more space, more social, two other artists in the room. Um, so that's happening tomorrow. And I'm, I'm sort of, I think I finally, uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to try and dig myself out of the sort of middle class trap where you kind of like, get into a certain standard of living and then you kind of have to just keep work 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 to sustain it and now I'm feeling like okay I'm sort of feeling control again for the first time in ages <laughs> so um that is a good feeling so I was, I was listening to some um some Lady Gaga <laughs> <laughs> does that help or does that well we've been well it's just the mood I was in like I was just because we've been watching this RuPaul's Drag Race we've been getting into it <laughs> we're season four we've been watching and we're down to the last four and um wow. it's been uh, it's been very good I haven't cried again or anything it's, it's it hasn't it hasn't sort of given delivered the emotion thing quite in the same way but and also we were reading some sort of behind the scenes stuff someone got kicked out it was like you have broken the rules you're going to sachet away and <laughs> <laughs> but like no specification. So then it was a, because it was a few years ago now, we were able to go and find on Twitter that the guy sort of like tweeted out some stuff about behind the scenes. It was like, well, that all sounds a bit grim. But you kind of knew it anyway. It's like, we're going to, they're all going to compete for $100,000. But I mean, they should, they're also, how much employment are they sacrificing for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it doesn't really feel like, it doesn't feel like a great deal. Well, it's exposure. Okay. <laughs> but I, I don't know. It's, it all feels a little bit exploitative, but um, it's also quite inspiring as well to see. What's the week have I had? Um, yeah, well, how's you doing? How's my week? How's you doing? How am I doing? Uh, it's near the end of my project, which I'm quite relieved about, really. I have, it's not been my favourite project ever. Mm. Um, but uh, but I think we're coming to a good a good recommendation that is a good use of taxpayer money. Mm. Uh, I did turn around to my colleague during the week and say, this project, I'm not sure if it's a solution looking for a problem. It's one of those. Mm. And we were talking around it, talking around it. And I was like, look, it's your tax money. <laughs> Do you think that <laughs> this is worth spending taxpayers' money on? Yes or no? <laughs> he was like, okay, now you put it like that. For like, fuck's sake. Anyway, so there was that. What else have I done? This DIT thing I enjoyed, the Department of International Trade. It was quite an eye-opener. I was quite... Uh, I was quite happy, you know, the the digital marketplace, the product that I I I drove to beta. I, obviously, I had a lot of help with, from a whole team. However, it was my pushing, putting my shoulders behind it. So I uh, was quite proud that it got some mentions. I was sitting there going, "Oh yes, uh, I wasn't." It was lot. There was lots of angels and deal makers, and because the Department mm. for International Trade has a whole program that's. Its job is to attract startups, oh, well, not just startups, companies to the UK. So they move their headquarters to the UK and they move <laughs> their manufacturing, their jobs, blah, blah, blah. Uh, 
the the kickoff of this was uh, this is a B word free zone this evening. <laughs> um, but they have like angel investors walking around. They have people from, you know, quite. I'm not going to say all over the world because not all countries were represented, but there were people mm. from far and wide with their startup, their tech ideas, tech products. Some examples of people who'd been very success- successful and had been supported by this. And this Manjula Lee in a worldwide generation thing is one of their, they had helped um, arrange funding and seed and whatever they did. But the, mm. it, but what was amusing to me, because I've never been to an event like it, is people walking up to me going, hi, I'm a deal maker. <laughs> so, uh. And they have a job title, like they have a, on their card. It says, deal, you know, like on their name badge. It's a job title. It's a thing that you do. You deal make. I was like, wow, deal make. Um, so I was like, I'm not really looking for any deals right now, but thanks. <laughs> I've got plenty of deals. I've got loads of deals. I do, I'd quite like to start paying attention to how these people are getting their funding, how they're kind of getting to do these projects. You've just got to brazen, be brazen. That's what I like. What what I will say on the subject of feminism and equality, mm. uh, there were there were there were three people that knew they were going to be talking about their startups. A one guy that got put on the spot. One of them was a woman and three were men. Hmm. We listened to a very boring man, a very cocky man, a very inarticulate man. And then okay. we listened to an amazingly inspiring woman <laughs> speak in front of this room. Like there's one of them who was like, he was like, and then we got our things and then we moved the thing. And I was like, <sighs> it's like, and all three examples were very impressive but it's like they couldn't be asked to tell you about it like in with mm. even some vague enthusiasm and this one of the one in the middle was just such a cock <laughs> it was like <laughs> it was like but of course you know blah, 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 blah. i was like oh, i can't even like i don't care but i did download his app um, well <laughs> it sounds like you uh, succumbed so, well <laughs> sound like sound like a decent app but it's probably not because of anything he's done <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he's good but anyway so i was, well, was quite it? i'm kind of intrigued by what the app was now that you've said there's an app was uh, it it was called seat frog okay and it does and basically it if you're about to get on a plane or a train traveling across europe i don't know worldwide i think you mm. you can like, if, if you're traveling close to departure you can see if you can get an upgrade ah there we go so it's about upgrading so you go, here's my booking reference. Uh, so, because I've been really looking into train travel across Europe. Yeah. Um, mm. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go and meet up. You know, I did that ski goddess holiday last year. Regular yes, listeners yeah. will remember my conversation <laughs> ski about my goddess. ski goddess holiday. Anyway, we're this year, those of us that were there last year, are going to go very late season and have a chat to her and probably be a bit of skiing, but also a bit of, so there'll be a bit of skiing and a bit of talking about how to help her develop her business. So we're having a summit, we're calling it. Mm. But I'm trying to avoid flying. Yeah. So, uh, so, and actually, you know, to get to Geneva or even closer to Chatel is perfectly doable and not that much more time or money. Mm. Uh, so I'd, I would tell, I was telling everyone, oh, I might meet you at Geneva airport or I might just, go closer you can't get to actual chateau but anyway and then then the two women who are near newcastle well like, oh, we will do the train that sounds good hmm. but the price of the ticket from newcastle to st pancras makes it prohibitively expensive <laughs> oh my god whereas the train from st pancras to geneva is as little as like 100 euros all the way through and then the, 100 euros yeah 113 wow. you know and that bearing in mind that if you you know like it takes about eight hours six to eight hours where if you calculate in the time to get to an airport the fact that you have to be there two hours before the flight time the waiting for your luggage time and all that business you're not actually losing that much time and you don't have to fly and your yeah. carbon usage is something like 27 kilo. Well, I, I don't know the units that they measure. I should know. Something mm. like kilos per something. It's like on a plane, it'd be something like 120 units of whatever they measure. Yeah. And on the train, it's like 23. So nice. it's a significant difference. Um, so well, we think we're going to we're going to probably go out to Berlin in March for a little just 
wander I, around, stay in a hotel, but I've been sort of, that looks like a 10 hour train journey. But I, fa- I found a really good website, a couple of really good websites um, I tweeted. Um, uh, there's a guy called Seat61. It's seat61.com and it's a mine of useful information because uh, I he also tells you, for example, to travel to Croatia. He sort of goes, well, you get the train to Munich and if you book on this train, you've got enough time to go to this restaurant and have some food <laughs> before the night. You know, like he, he's right. super nerd, train nerd. Um, and then he he funds his site through affiliates. So I used right. his affiliate, his recommended train ticket thingy. Mm. Uh, Can we take the Orient Express? I think that's extremely expensive. <laughs> Does it still exist? We watched that remake of the, well, watched that modern version of the murder on the Orient Express the other weekend. It looked like a nice train journey. Well, I used to as a child. Why We never flew when we lived in Yugoslavia and we were coming back to visit grandparents in England. We always took a train because my father was afraid of flying, which meant that we oh. weren't allowed to fly either. <laughs> so we would get the train. And there used to be this train called the Tauern Express, which you could get on in split on the coast of Croatia. And it went all the way to Ostend in Belgium. Mm. So you didn't have to change trains. You didn't have to. You just nice. sat on a train for two days and then got on a ferry. And uh, there you go. that was quite cool. But, you know, I think for traveling with a kid, I was thinking this summer I might take my child on the train <laughs> because mm. uh, I, I enjoy I have nice memories of big, long train journeys. When I was little. We're going to talk about the silver gun hypothesis. Last week we read through, go back to last week if you want to hear us confusedly reading through or just i don't know like that the the introduction of his blog post sparked a lot of thoughts and a lot of you know ideas and a lot of you know it just it was just a conversation it was a very good catalyst for talking about a lot of different things um this week i'm going to try to sort of clarify what i think he's trying to do what i think the the um the nub of his insight is come on let's just get stuck in we're gonna get stuck in and we're gonna i'm I'm just gonna see if my uh my understanding of it holds water with a conversation with ivanka before i have the conversation with delton again (laughs) Uh, (laughs) so i i've 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 found two sort of central central ideas to this um this thing he's got now my sense, having talked to him for a while and having kind of had having had him explain sort of more detail on the different aspects of it, and also him trying to sort of like tell me sort of like how he thinks I should try and explain it, which, uh, you know, I don't know if I necessarily think he's on the right track. I think he's very close to it. And I think he's sort of got, he's gone down this rabbit hole of, I want to find a sort of scientific proof I want to prove from first principles that my idea will work. Yeah, he, he's sort of, it's like he wants to prove that his economic theory, his hypothesis will hold water from first principles, which I think is good. But at the end of the day, it's kind of economics is ultimately a sort of social theory. It's not like physics. No, it's ultimately opinion, isn't it? Made well, up. Well, <laughs> it's ultimately it's a hypothesis that you need at some point you need to just try yeah, yeah and no yeah. amount of kind of like filling it back with theory and um you know sort of building it on theories and sort of proving it and doing maths and you know all that kind of thing is really a substitute for just and and also if your co- explanation is so complex that it can't persuade people to try this thing then that's obviously not a strategy no. that's going to work like if no one's will, you can't expect people to understand the entire thing in order to try it but what here is what i think what what the thing that he wants to try is so if we just sort of forget about why forget about all the thermodynamics but then i think there's also he's got some really good metaphors and really good ideas about why this will work that are quite easy to explain i think but the what seems to be 
um, you create uh, this currency, this uh, carbon mitigation. He's like straight away was into it. You've got to abate or sequester carbon, and it's like ah. <laughs> <laughs> so sequester carbon means um, like bringing you know de-entropying the carbon, bringing it back out of where it's doing damage. Trees sequester carbon. And, um, Sequester. Yeah, Who's yeah. ever used that in a sentence? Well, Delton Chen. But yeah, so well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into that kind of language when I talk about it. But okay, the idea is, what you're gonna do, you're gonna get your central bank to offer a certain amount of this currency as an investment, and what that will do, that will provide a guaranteed rate of return, which is kind of slightly higher than. Um, like government bonds, that kind of thing. It's guaranteed to be a low-risk investment, a guaranteed rate of return. And then, so that's the sort of, um, that's the carrot of all this. So the investors, that, that you know, they've got their portfolio of investments. Some of it's in property, some of it's in bonds, some of it's in like high-risk stuff like the stock market. This is another way, place that they can put their money that is... Um, on the risk spectrum, very low down because they have designed it from the ground up to be this is a low risk investment. Um, and risk plays a key part of the dichotomy he's created. It's risk versus efficiency. But I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so you, so basically you get all these, you get, take this wealth as an investment and then you turn it into an ecosystem that rewards the sequestering of carbon <laughs> that rewards <laughs> environmentally positive behaviour. And when I asked him, like, well, how, how are people going to decide? He, he sort of said, well, we'll have a peak authority that will be the internet. Well, that's what I've written down. I don't know if that makes sense. Is a peak authority a thing? I don't know. Uh, let me, I'm just going to Google peak authority because cause I've written that those words down, but I don't seem to. So, so, but, so just... Yeah. So, so far... We've got people who already have lots of, they already have lots of money. They have lots of investments. Yeah. We're giving them another place to invest money. We're giving them an alternative, another alternative. Yeah. And my, the way I'd quite like to present this. Yeah. As the way I'd quite like to get people to buy into this is if they're putting more of their wealth into this thing that we've created that will ultimately go to like resolving some environmental issues yeah. that also takes it out of those sort of inner city property investments that I've been complaining yeah, about yeah, 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 and yeah, like yeah. generally kind of like gives wealthy people without asking them to give up their wealth it gives them somewhere to put it that's actually sort of socially benefit yeah, you know apart from paying taxes can... but somewhere that yeah, benefits yeah, yeah, the yeah, environment yeah. benefits all of us and that I think yeah. in itself if you can make that work is it doesn't it doesn't ask you to sacrifice anything because no, once you've no, got no, this no. money, you just want a rate of return on it. Um, I mean, the, sorry, I'll just because yeah. it made me think the, the reason this originally even came up is because when I was talking to Claire, we were talking about the fact, you know, you and I have spoken about this. Like, you know, if you have, you can either have lots of people that have a little bit of power grouping together mm. or a small number of people with a lot of power releasing some of their power. And I think part of the trick trick of 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 actually accelerating some of these um sustainability tools and goals and all this will be in luring cash power away from the 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 the, the hoarding that it's in yeah. with the 1% and the, the 1% need to let that yeah. money out yeah. to be used for better things than urban you know, luxury apartments in the middle of town centres. Yeah, that is just one option. And actually yes. we can create options that are a bit more beneficial. And I yeah, think yeah. if that works, that could be a game changer, right? We're not yeah. asking anyone to make a sacrifice, but we're creating this new ecosystem where you can, yeah. like also anyone can invest in, in into this market and buy and sell within this market of um, sort of positive service, whatever, carbon thing that that. Like you can you can get a whole industries around this, and the principle of it is it's, it's basically a second economy that coexists with the first. Yeah. Um, and that when you start thinking about it becomes an interesting idea, which I yeah I, I don't know how much more we even need to talk about that explanation. Yeah. I think that was quite quick to give. <laughs> yeah, 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 and that make that's much more like you. Re I mean, it's it's like. Uh, 
there's a thing of how much do you need to know in order to act? Yes, <laughs> like, exactly. You know, I don't necessarily need to know all the sequestering of carbon and the entropy and the thermodynamics and the whatever. It's like, you know, I don't need to be able to build a car to drive a car. Yeah, exactly. And this was this yeah. was the kind okay. of how I approached my conversation with Dalton. Okay, that's, just that's... like we we but I do want I need to kind of have a reasonably good understanding of it so that I can know that I'm explaining it. But yeah. the explanation itself does not need to encompass every single field. It's like, okay, well here are the references. If you want to read more on that aspect, if you're an economist, yeah. you know about well, these yeah. four paradoxes of economics, you can see how it addresses them using thermodynamics and entropy. If you're a scientist, you can sort of validate the thermodynamic stuff that's gone into it. If you're from a different field, you can sort of work together to um you know, it's 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 it's, it's too much for one uh, one human that doesn't have 5 yeah, years yeah. to devote their lives to it, right? And also, I think when you are working like on something for that long, it, it is very easy to get, you know, you're in the weeds quite a lot. I think you're going to be, I, I know it of myself, like you're going to suddenly every detail is really important <laughs> yeah. and yeah, really yeah. from a top le level explanation. OK, we're going to give business, going to give the wealthy somewhere else to put their money that will benefit the environment um, yeah. in the form of a new economy. And we can to some extent, prove that that will work with maths if you want to more background to take the plunge and try it. And then I thought for the blanks, I, I thought that would even work on a single country scale. Yeah. You could just do it. One country could go, okay, well, the, the Bank of England or the Bank of New... St I need a good name for my... <laughs> He's also working with a, a, an organisation called Possible Planet... So I think um, blank state is a is a new country on the planet of possible planet. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I think I'm thinking of it like that. I think I still want to kind of keep the 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 country idea. Um, but he also said like, yeah, you could probably kind of like just join forces with them, do it under that thing, and kind of then be able to take donations through their sort of charity stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so. This is, I, I thought this was going to, this isn't a huge conversation, is it? It's like, okay, right, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes much more sense. <laughs> yeah. It's just like thing. So, but here's, here's, the, here's the sort of cool way of, the interesting way of thinking about it that he kind of um, hinted at, that he talked about. The reason why our economy, so he says like, we are animals. We what? breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. We are we as animals emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So yeah. in a way, it stands to reason that our economy would emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. we've sort of built our economy in our own image. And I, I think he does a, he, do, he does have a much more scientific ways of thinking about that. But actually, just intuitively, it's like okay, we're animals, so we've sort of made a kind of animal economy. But what he says yeah. is, like, animals aren't the only thing that exists. There are also trees. Um, yeah. Things like trees who take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn that back into oxygen. And in a way, this second economy is sort of like the tree to our animal. What? So what? Sorry, what's the tree to our animal? So the tree is yeah. is the economy the new economy that he's proposing. Oh, I see. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's going to take carbon out. and Yeah, it's going to kind yeah, of complete yeah. the loop. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the sort of, that's the metaphor for it. And also, like, and then of course I'm going to get carried away and go, oh, well, what if there were loads of different economies? <laughs> like, why do we, 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 we've sort of grown into this one economy, but like there's no reason you couldn't, like this, this sort of just shows that, if you kind of expand your thinking a bit that okay well we could have another economy that is and he he the the key difference being risk so we as animals we we trade risk for this is this is, this is the bit where i find it harder to kind of put in put clearly or kind of really quite put my finger on is we operate in a sort of high risk state like we move around in real time and kind of like have to kill things and jump down holes and, and you know, bash things and deal with explosions and all that kind of thing. Um, but as a result, we kind of, the rewards are much greater 
like the occasional rewards are much bigger because your yield you're, you're putting more risk in, but you're getting much bigger yields out. And it's but it's quite a sort of short termist strategy. And as we see played out across, you know, all human behavior and economics and just personally, we would usually rather have something now than later. Yeah. Um, trees and things like that, in, they are they sort of take a much more low risk, long term strategy. They're much more resi- like mycelia, like mushroom networks, like they're a lot more resilient to kind of uh, sudden changes um, because risk is specialization i mean uh, no wait uh, that, so the other th- is efficiency so th- there's efficiency versus risk right we're, yeah. we're optimized we're very we're optimized for efficiency efficiency right um we're high risk and as such we are efficient um at but what 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 efficiency is what efficiency means is you're sort of specialized towards a, a particular environment um, I read this about a programming thing. It's like uh, recently, it's like if you get really, if your environment is stable on a certain time scale, then you sort of evolve to, you, you know, evolve a, lo- a long beak that can kind of go into the anthill and you're very efficient at extracting value from your environment as long as nothing changes, changes about your environment. <laughs> Whereas a so, tree or a mycelium, or, you know, those sorts of ecosystems are much more resilient to changing environments. So they've, they've reduced the risk, but they've, they're much less efficient. So what capitalism and our current economy is all geared towards is efficiency and like, effi- like efficiency above all else. But it's very high risk. And we're seeing this when it comes to, you know, the climate change things that are happening. Um, and, the, you know, the financial crisis, it's like you, you get very efficient at um, extracting value from the status quo. But as soon as that status quo changes, you're, yeah, you, yeah, you haven't yeah. got any tools anymore. And yeah. so the idea of this second economy is, is a different sort of structure that is designed f- to be low risk and y- low yield over time, but I mean, stable. Yeah. Well, sustainable is sort of the opposite of efficiency is it like sustainable has this sort of like slow steady ploddy kind of implication in the word itself whereas efficiency is like no talking get on with it it has this sort of there's certainly a speed factor yeah. don't look anywhere uh, else except at the thing that you are yeah, specialized in yeah that yeah just do that and there's a sort of and you can see how that sort of you, and you can be, you can take. Yeah, you can only be efficient in a in a in a stable environment. I'm yeah. saying what everything you just said. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the speed of processing. Yeah, um, and, but what I would say is like, yeah. I would I would say the way I'm thinking about sustainability is more like, you need a complete ecosystem for it to be sustainable. The same way that for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, like plants and animals have coexisted and one's taken yeah, yeah, you, carbon yes. out and the other's put it Sorry, in. And yeah. You, you, yeah. You complete the loop, but it's when the yeah. loop, go, when you sort of only have half of what you need, it's just going to yeah. kind of like go out of control and just, you know, go wrong. Well, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So it basically is comp- it's, it's basically not depleting anything. So in the same way, like in an efficiency drive in a work environment, often it's the humans that end up very, very tired mm. <laughs> and depleted. Mm. And at some point they all crash mm. and then the project goes to shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good analogy? Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sustainability isn't about uh, slowness per, per se. There's, there's, for me, mentally, just in the word, and maybe not when I speak, I'm just thinking about it really, but there's a sort of um, uh, a slow steadiness, maybe. Is hmm. that the word I'm looking for? So you kind yeah. of have this steady progress that then means that you have to, um, but nothing becomes depleted. So depleted. You can think about it. In yeah. terms of redundancy as well, like uh, a 
tree loses a branch, it's still perfectly yeah. good at like extracting yeah. oxygen. You know, it's still perfectly good at photosynthesis. Uh, yeah. A person loses a finger, sort of like, ooh, <laughs> person loses a hand, that's a big deal. Um, we're we're kind of op- we're specialised to a certain thing, but if we go wrong, it's it can be relatively catastrophic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is the state we've found ourselves in. So I think that's I think that's. I mean, do you think that sounds sounds much more um, sounds you know good? So why is he not what you know? He's been working on it for five years. Doing what? Just like having to learn about thermodynamics and all these different things. So he's, um, his, his background is monetary theory and thermodynamics, biophysical economics, ecological economists, more disciplined than normal economists, civil engineering he's done a lot in, PhD in chemical engineering, and he's worked in climate mitigation. And, and on this thing so far, he's published two papers and two chapters of his, of his um I guess, the blog post that we've been reading. So he's got another, like, three chapters to kind of put out there still. The second one's coming out mid-March, apparently. So he's just, like, writing it up, I think, at this stage. So who does he need to, What you know, like, in his mind's eye, who's going to pick this up? I think he's uh, I think he's targeting economists, probably, sort of trying to get, like, like influential economists to see the his sort of, like, his math and sort of be able to go, ah, right. Because what one thing he he said, like, if you do introduce this second economy, it's sort of like when you look back at the normal economy, it sort of ends up some solutions fall out of that that kind of explain some of the paradoxes we're currently facing um, that, that economists currently can't quite figure out. Like one he talked about was... There's this one paradox where, like, you would think that by increasing the efficiency of something that there would be an overall reduction in in use of it. So by, re- like, making it more efficient to get petrol, that there would be an overall reduction in, you know, the cost of it or the expense of it. But for some reason, when you increase efficiency, quite often you also... It also comes with an increase in usage as well. It's like... um, Because people go, hey, it's not such a faff now, so I'll do more of it. It's kind of like LA kind of building loads of roads to make it really car friendly and and then weirdly having the worst traffic anywhere, whereas London, they sort of like nip that in the bud a bit. So it's it it never got quite that chronic, even though I have to look at the West Way all the time. But luckily, London isn't all entirely... Um, sort of big freeways like like somewhere like LA, which it could very easily have been. Um, like the more kind of potential you make, you sort of end up inviting more. And that that's that's a paradox that I have explained badly and not given you the name of. So does it stay in the podcast? I don't know. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, a formal part two provides a formal solution for growth versus degrowth and a degrowth economy. So um, that's what he wants to talk about. Um, asymmetry of the first law of thermodynamics, solutions to some intractable problems of ent- of, um, of economics by bringing in concepts, the concept of entropy and sort of thermodynamics. Oh, it's a Jevons paradox. So hang on. Jevons. Me, Jevons paradox. I found it in the margin. Jevons paradox says that... Um, occurs when technological progress or government policy increases the efficiency with which a resource is used, but the rate of consumption of that resource rises due to increasing demand. So more or less what we said, but that's the formal. Yeah. But it's going to be one of my new phrases this week. I'm going to see how many times I can use the one of the economic paradoxes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> see if I can wind it into a meeting. But actually, the opposite on my project that I'm working on at the moment, mm. that's quite interesting because I would like to take advantage of that paradox <laughs> <laughs> to increase. Can you do it? I mean, does it work in the opposite? Like if I increase it, can I, you know, increasing the consumption of something, sorry, increasing the efficiency of something with the aim of increasing usage? Yeah, well, I think or decreasing the efficiency with the aim of decreasing usage. <laughs> I mean, I might refer to this Jevons. For, this is exactly Jevons. what I need, like, as a bit of proof for why it's worth doing the thing that I want to do in Excellent. this project. Excellent. I'll be like, look, I I refer to economics theory here. Mm. <laughs> so, 
Um, the other thing he talked about was um, Jeremy England, who has sort of talked about why life forms as a result of it just probabilistically is likely to form. Um, why is DNA likely to form? So that's something I'm not going to try and get into. I don't really understand <laughs> how it's remotely connected to this this uh, this uh, silver gun hypothesis. But it's worth having a look at Jeremy England's talks, nevertheless, because it's quite interesting if you want to think about okay, life I've in noted. terms of thermodynamics. I mean, beyond that, I think that's pretty cool. That's it. I think. I think. I think. I will. You know, I'm gonna. I'm gonna kind of write this up into a, into a script that's sort of like. And I think the two parts of it was like, imagine if we created this new kind of money, and I want to just show the network effects of people a taking the money out of the stuff that's damaging, putting it in something useful visualizing that ecosystem of people doing carbon positive activities and getting paid for it in this new currency and more and more people adopting it as um, in parallel with the existing economy if they want to do things that are good and then just sort of like visualize this sheep this animals versus trees thing sort of say look we've got an animal because we're animals we need to just sort of also have a tree or we're going to just Die. So it's, I mean, they, they, now <laughs> the, mm. compared to our last conversation, this seems like infinitely sensible thinking. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, mm. compared to last week where we were like, so hang on a minute, it's just that. So yeah, anyway, I feel convinced. Yeah, I think I think <laughs> the writing, his writing, he's too close to it. He's been too close, and I yeah. and I will validate that I haven't missed some entire point but I actually said that you know a couple of things that I you know when I, the questions I asked he was like yeah that's actually a really good explanation so I was like okay right <laughs> I feel like I haven't completely missed the point um I he's he's you know an academic type minded person is always going to want to sort of obsess over every last detail of it but that's not what we need in order to you know you don't like I have learned <laughs> um like don't let the details don't let the facts get in the way of a good story <laughs> or well, don't let yeah. the, don't get so fixated on all of the details that you can't tell a story and we need to have a story for it to be communicable and i am yeah. sort of starting to hone in on that so yeah very Let's talk about something else <laughs> oh yeah i would i'd like to uh i think it would be nice to create just a short uh, intro because you know I have sent his paper to mm. a couple of people and obviously he has too, um, but nobody but being able to follow up to them and say including you know bankers and mm. a variety of people who may even have some useful influence, mm. but being able to send them a, a a pithy intelligible never mind pithy an intelligible summary yeah or easily digestible yeah. Might get, us a bit, yeah. might get a bit more traction. Do you want to try? Do you, should we look at this other thing? Yeah, I think I was, I was kind of. I'm going to send you the link for this now because I think the because weakest link in the actual pra practical. The practicality of implementing this second economy is that there is it is kind of subjective. It's potentially subjective what get what this gets used for, and is also like I'm sure it sort of feels a little bit prone to corruption. Um, if yeah. that kind of risk, if that assessment of is have, has what you've done been effective against climate change or not, if that sort of gets corrupted, then the whole thing is fairly pointless. It's just, yeah. you know, it turns into the same thing we've already got. 
Um, so what was the what was that? So this is so I said the link. Maybe oh, you worldwide. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basic. This the woman started her talk with. We have got ten years to halt or slow down catastrophic climate change mm. to save life on Earth. Basically, was her start it opener, and I was like, oh hello. Mm. <laughs> This sounds more like my cup of tea. Uh, and then uh, she was beginning to end. She was inspirational. She talked about having a company with purpose and how much easier it is to... She doesn't have to work to inspire her staff because she's she's articulated a vision. Everybody's behind the vision. People, you know, will give up a 200 grand job in the city to come and work for her project mm. because it's worth doing mm. so the website itself is very slick we mm. have a look they've got this mission statement which i think is pr pretty much what she said we, you know we are we are worldwide generation a sustainability fintech startup aiming to deliver the most ambitious project in human history a global resolution to poverty inequality and climate change by 2030 boom <laughs> there's mm. no like there's no like oh we want to improve life for certain people no and this is you know without being some sort of she was very nice because i walked over to her at the end after everyone had finished talked to her, i was like I said, I just want to walk over and say something very fangirly. Mm. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Thank you very much. It was very inspiring. You know, all the best type thing rather mm. than uh, because uh, she was very cool. So then I've just, um, I haven't really had a chance. I haven't had any time to look at this properly. So it's connected. Very, she's But she's been in front of the UN. She's connected to them, not just in a... Uh, I'm going to worry about the UN sustainability goals. She's been there and presented to them. And this is where getting involved in this uh, Department of International Trade gang has been useful. You know, they've helped open doors and use mm. contacts. And I think she got Unilever on board quite early right. who were willing to fund a pilot mm. just to get it off the ground because yeah. they, however she presented this and however she explained what she was doing, uh, it was sufficiently it convinced them to give her the money to get going. And so, and as I understand it, you can go, as I said earlier, you it's a way of uh, recording, registering, validating, measuring that the project you said you did, were going to do actually did what achieved the aims. So it uh, might, might be our homework for next week yeah, to discuss. Okay. All right. um, now that we've got um, old... Uh, Delton Chen sorted, <laughs> but what what I wouldn't object I wouldn't object to taking like you know we could do a a Google Doc um, description yeah um, and then you know see if we can come up with a, yeah, a, a short paragraph version. for each angle short version of a few yeah. things yeah. that then we could try sharing and seeing what sort of uh, response we get because I'd be interested in sh sending this uh, description. This thing you were talking about, the, 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 the existence of a central bank that will offer a certain amount of this currency guaranteed to give a good rate of return mm. bit uh, to the banker guy. See yeah. what he says. Yeah. Um, because I think that's his. And I think you could quite easily supplement it with the animal tree analogy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that looks... I okay. like it. You may or may not have noticed that last week I did, uh, you know, in the spirit of um, in the spirit of equanimity, I, I sort of left in a bit more some pauses and some ums and ahs. Like I still took out where it's just like you know the sort of non-starting things or when it was you know when we were you know actually trying to kind of pu pull a thought together. But I pulled out all those little because I've been sort of kind of paranoidly cutting out every microsecond of hesitation and things like that, <laughs> like um, which. I mean, I think was more necessary when we started recording this thing because we were yeah. kind of a lot looser. Um, but now, like, if even if we do sort of trip up, we're recovering and we're not having to... I'm not having to kind of edit that out because it's kind of like we say something and it all kind of hangs together. And it's. And I think it's... So I was... I think peak edits was like... I had like four, five hundred edits in an episode, but last week's was more like a hundred. And it wow. was an hour and a half long. But I think mainly because the subject was complicated. But... 
we it seems to, at least one person one listener was compelled to tweet at us with a very nice review so um yeah. i i feel vindicated in that decision to just okay we i mean i don't, I don't think it's a deal breaker if we kind of like if, i don't know, misread something and then have to kind of start again uh, if you're already kind of up for listening to us for an hour it's probably you know and and maybe it pays off with making us because this isn't a radio show this isn't some bbc thing with a intro or anything it's a podcast it's a different thing and i think it's okay for us to it to be a little bit more relaxed and and we can just be confident that we're not going to look stupid even if we hesitate once in a while yes so yeah there we go yes there we go thanks for listening thank you very much for listening if you like the podcast go to grandpodcast.com where can people find you Ivanka you can find me at Ivanka on Twitter and you can find much more of Michael Forrest's music at michaelforrestmusic.com you can also find some of his videos he makes about how to make music using (laughs) things that you wouldn't be you wouldn't think we're going to be making music like weird cardboard circles (laughs) stuff like that it's true and inflatable aliens so that's me plenty plenty of interesting things to see um so yes we're still working out the uh, still working out the format on uh, on the flattery (laughs) on the flattery i don't i just it's it's just more like the music i i make all the music on this so if you like it there's more at michaelforestmusic.com thank you yes um and then come to but my big project at the moment is blankstate.org and um, to some extent done good.app if you want to have a look at please come and have a look if you are interested in doing good and I am going I'm working on making that a bit more of an uh, addictive thing <laughs> sounds, sounds very dark Michael it is it's uh, growth hacking uh, it's yeah. uh, it's all about extracting value from your attention so we <laughs> make an addictive product that you're constantly launching and then we sell that attention to advertisers and just basically we're farming every time you pick up Instagram and start scrolling through it that is some time that you are generously giving to uh, an investor somewhere who's put some money in and wants a return and the growth is happening at your expense I know some of those pictures are nice also here's a top tip it shows an advert every five posts so just skip every fifth don't look at every fifth and then you'll be fine save save me some time (laughs) and if you're if you're based in Brighton I'd like to encourage you to vote in the Brighton Restaurant Awards.co.uk the Bravos Mm. Um, How's so that going? When, when's that? When's that? Uh, we've had a lot of votes this year so far. So, uh, but basically, it's a public vote, so anyone can log in and vote for the restaurants that they like in sixteen categories. It's a very, it's a very nice thing. The restaurants that get featured and get and win get lots of attention from the people who like to go out and let's say have brunch or drinks or there's lots of categories anyway. So mm. check it out if you're in Brighton. If you don't know these places. We don't want any cheaters, you know. <laughs> Just so you know, oh no cheaters. <laughs> Do you know, that reminds me of our uh, podcast. Please vote for us in the podcast awards. And I'm just thinking now, we really made a mistake by focusing on the public, of which we have very limited access to, <laughs> instead of focusing on the judges who would have been able to say, listen to it and go, oh, that's a good podcast. We'll put you in for it. Yeah. So I next think it year, costs to enter. Next time, we're sending flower baskets. <laughs> <laughs> we're sending gift baskets to the judges we're, just we're gonna, gonna make be this like a a... oscars kind of like campaign yeah, yeah. spend a million <laughs> pounds <laughs> do you remember uh, uh at lbi one of the big cheeses i know there was a conversation with some award givers that went so how much is it going to cost us to win this award mm. Uh, so yes, hey, that's how that. it goes. How do you think so the Oscars? Goes. Basically, the Oscars they they spend a million dollars on that campaign because they know if they've got an Oscar that they can sell that film and make a lot more back. So when you turn a million dollars into personal gifts and stuff, that's nuts. So you know, good luck getting your independent film noticed when there's that uh, machine at work. <laughs> so if we want an award, we're gonna have to you know. Or we're just going to have to make friends with someone with influence, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. Anyway, the Bravos are a public vote, so go vote! Or just no bribe Ivanka. No flowers necessary. 
No, because it's a vote. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't bribe Ivanka. All right. Uh, well, thanks for listening. Lovely to see you. <laughs> lovely to see you. <laughs> you Ivanka. Um, thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 bye.